part of the picture I'm getting is, okay, so we know how to grow these diamonds for all kinds of great high-tech applications, but do the tech companies who are going to be using them, do, do they know about this? Do they understand the availability, the technological advances that they offer? I mean, when you talk to tech companies, they're, they're engineers and scientists. Again, they kind of know the basics. Some of them say, um, oh, yeah, we heard about that 15 years. In fact, I was at a trade show and one of the scientists said, yeah, I heard about that 15 years ago. And uh, we never touched it. It was, you know, not really reliable and way, it costs way too much. And I said, well, it's not like that anymore. The reason it's not like that is because growing for the gem industry took off. There's now a you know huge market for grown diamond, lab-grown diamond for, for jewelry. So that really propelled the entire industry forward and the ability to grow for tech. They're pretty you know, wide-eyed. In fact, they often say, and I had this exact conversation with someone at, um, at another trade show, they said, oh, you know, I just got engaged and I bought my wife a lab-grown diamond engagement ring and she loves it. I said, perfect. Now, imagine taking that diamond, manipulating it, slicing it, polishing it, growing it bigger, growing it thinner, whatever you need, and putting it into your tech applications. And he said, well, you know, 15 years ago, when someone approached us on this, we just thought, you know, forget it. And then the cost was way out of bounds and we need volume. So I said, okay, okay. So I'm standing there at, at this show and I have a couple of growers with me. And I said, well, tell me, tell me what your needs are today. And he said, okay, well, you know, we're, we're going to need this price range. It was much lower than GEM. So both of my growers who have been in the gem industry, are a little taken back. I said, okay, that's all right. What about the volume? And he says, oh, well, I'm going to need, you know, I don't know. And he had, he had a guy with him, a consultant with him. And he goes, well, I'm probably going to need about 4 million units. So now my two growers, you know, their eyes are big. And they're going, oh, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. And then the, the consultant goes, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, sorry, he misspoke. I, 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 I don't think he said that right. And I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? And he goes, they order per quarter. So he needs 4 million units per quarter. So now both of my growers want to pass out on the floor. But, <laughs> you know, that's the, the disparity between that maybe what the use can be and what the awareness or understanding is. This is another reason why we started this this consortium of everyone in the supply chain. We're trying to bring them in, educate each other, help push evolvement of this product forward, and build not just the ecosystem, but a supply chain. The supply chain has to be functioning for all these different applications I mentioned a few minutes ago. So that's really going to be a challenge, right? but I think we can do it. If we learned anything from smartphones, a few billion units a year does do a fair amount of jacking up a, a, a new industry and, and bringing prices down. So uh, <laughs> definitely volume can, can drive all that. But that makes me think about one of the really hot topics that you mentioned it in passing a couple of times, and that's quantum computing. It seems to be evolving extremely quickly. I mean, just like a year, a couple of years ago, it seems we had two qubits was a, was a big deal. And now, you know, we've got bigger systems doing all kinds of stuff. I, I have to confess that I describe myself as a Newtonian creature stuck in an Einsteinian universe. So I'm, <laughs> I have trouble wrapping my head around some of the quantum stuff. But, but I do understand a little bit about you know, how Diamond might be able to, to play a role in that, especially with the, the, the NV technology. We have a clip from one of the world's leading quantum scientists, Bart McKilson. And he talks about how he uses lab-grown diamond in his work. My name's Bart Mahilsa. I'm a quantum research scientist. So we, we sort of have a unique expertise in identifying the you know, materials, the protocols, the technologies that will make it possible to distribute quantum information over long distances. And one of the avenues we're exploring is via diamond. I think 
Perhaps the fundamental challenge in quantum networking is finding the right post-material emitter pair that has properties that make it viable for real-world deployment. So uh, the sort of core element of a quantum network is a quantum repeater, and the core element of that is a quantum memory. And so really, the function of this memory is to basically catch information that's propagating on light, store it on the memory, do some simple processing, and essentially enable it to be propagated further. So for a memory to serve this purpose, it needs to really effectively interface with light. And we're talking about single photons, single bits of light, and needs to be able to capture the information that's stored on that light and save it for an extended period of time. And, you know, this probably sounds like a complicated endeavor and to some, the way, in some ways it is. And so people have spent 20 plus years looking for the right quantum memory. And the search is still ongoing. I want to be very clear, but one of the, the very promising candidates are quantum memories in diamond. So really what we're looking at here are these sort of substitutional defects, you know, the, the nitrogen vacancy and silicon vacancy. These are things that I guess a lot of serious diamond people are already familiar with in some capacity. Uh, but it's basically an atom plus a couple of vacancies that have combined. And these uh, emitters have really cool properties. They have long memory times, and they interface really effectively with light. And so, you know, those are the two main requirements for good memory for quantum networking. But Diamond also has a lot of other nice properties, right? It's it's not sort of a standard CMOS material, but it is, uh, in principle, processable in many of the same ways we do process semiconductor chips. And that gives it another added advantage that, you know, it hosts these cool memories by default. And then you can really carve the diamond into whatever configuration you need in order to facilitate sort of optimal operation of this memory. And it's really those properties together that make diamond very interesting. Its strengths are it naturally hosts good memories and you can shape it into photonic and electronic devices very naturally using already existing tools.